Good morning. I want to invite you for these next few Sundays to a short series from the book of Philippians. Paul uh, pens this letter uh, to the church in Philippi about 12 years after he launched the church. And the reason for the letter is basically a deep affection that the church and Paul have for one another. It's a very short book. You can read it in a few minutes. 16 times he mentions the word joy or rejoice because Paul knew the importance of finding joy once again. Now, if you know me, you know I love to laugh. I love to tell a joke, hear a joke. One of the things that I miss on Sunday mornings is uh, something funny said during the announcements and just looking, panning the audience and just watching the whole congregation in laughter and and seeing seeing your smiling faces. Um, I know that those days are coming um, and we'll be together real soon enjoying that laughter. Sometimes when enough bad things happen to us, we lose our laugh and stop smiling. And worse than all that, we stop singing. And, um, you know, life has a way of putting our joy in jail. Uh, Life is hard. Life has a way of taking all of our joy away. And I know that it's a little bit risky uh, standing before you talking about joy when all you feel like doing right now is just surviving or just enduring this moment. And a, a lot of that is because we line up our thinking in this way, that if if I can control everything and make everything um, the way I want it, then I can be happy. It's circumstantial. And so happiness for a lot of us only happens whenever everything lines up the way that I want it to. So we only experience happiness occasionally. Well, the biblical witness says that happiness is a matter of choice. And what I believe that God wants to do is raise up witnesses to a world that is sad and very unhappy. Nehemiah chapter 8 and verse 10 says, The joy of the Lord is our strength. The strength that we have to get through difficult times comes from a joy of having the Lord in our lives. Um, one observation that I, that I want to make is that, yeah, there are a lot of Christians who aren't happy. Um, that's uh, that's uh, it's their choice. It's available to all of us, but not all of us reach out and grab it. The Bible says in Romans chapter 14, verse 17, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of what we eat or drink, but of living a life of goodness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. And so Paul is describing the Holy Spirit as this river that runs uh, within believers, and it runs under the circumstances of our lives. And Paul finds himself under some very unusual circumstances as he pens his letter to the church in, in Philippi because he is in prison as he writes this letter. And the reason that he is in prison is not because of something wrong that he's done, but it's because he cannot help but speak of the source of the joy. And so he opens up the letter by saying in verse 1 and 2 of chapter 1, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all God's holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons, grace and peace to you from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. And so he mentions Jesus three times. This book has 104 verses, 51 times he mentions the the name Jesus. And so he is obsessed with Jesus. And it all happened whenever he was on the road to Damascus to persecute Christians. And he has an encounter with Jesus. And ever since that encounter, he sees life, all of life, through the lens of Christ. And whenever you and I Look at life through the lens of Jesus Christ. We are in a position to discover joy. And so this is how Paul saw it. What I want to do is take a few minutes and just point out a couple of verses in each chapter and help you to understand how Paul saw Jesus. And so he, first of all, one observation in chapter one, he sees Jesus as his purpose. Paul never believed that God was obligated to give him an easy life. 
In fact, the encounter that Paul had on the Damascus Road, Jesus told him, I want you to go into town and a man will meet you there and he will tell you how much you must suffer for my name. He never believed that following Jesus would result in a comfortable life, but he did believe that it would be a meaningful life. In chapter 1, verses 12 and 13, now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. What's happening here is because Paul is in Rome and actually, you know, in, in the palace, Jesus Christ, the message of Christ is also there. Wherever Paul went, the message of Christ went with him. In fact, he kind of wraps up the letter in Philippians chapter 4, verse 22, by saying, all the saints send you greetings, especially those who belong to Caesar's household. The Lord, the Lord has made his way into Caesar's household because Paul, who is a prisoner there, has, has brought Christ along with him. Everywhere Paul went, Christ went with him. And now the message of Jesus has found its way into Rome, the very place that Paul wanted to take, the gospel. Now I want to ask you this question. What if you found your joy not in what was easiest for you, but what, in, what was best for the gospel? What if you found your joy not in what was easiest for you, but in what is best for the gospel? There are people that hear that question and they understand it. We would never sign up to lose a loved one. We would never sign up uh, to experience the loss through abandonment. We would never sign up for financial failure or any kind of disease, cancer. But what we have learned is that sometimes bad news, the bad news that comes into our lives results in the opportunity to be able to talk about the good news of Jesus in a way that we would never have been able to. And so for Paul... Paul's obsession, Paul's singular purpose is to exalt Jesus Christ. And there's nowhere you could put Paul where he couldn't do this because Jesus was his purpose. Jesus is also his pattern. He intentionally focuses on others instead of focusing on himself. Well, he learns this from following Jesus, the pattern of Jesus. Philippians chapter 2 verse 3 says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant and being, and being made in human likeness. The reality is that you and I cannot have joy in our lives if our relationships are falling apart. Relationships make and break us. And relationships give us life or they drain the life from us. And so what Paul is describing here is really he's given us a definition of what love is. I love whenever I have a young couple in front of me and they're and, and they're doing premarital counseling and I ask I ask the guy, hey, why why are you marrying this girl? And he says, because I love her. And then I love this follow-up question, what is love? Uh, usually, you know, they kind of squirm trying to trying to bring about the definition of love. Um, what Paul is doing here is giving us def the biblical definition of love is putting the interest of another person above your own interest. This is love. It's a predominant theme throughout the Bible. And so it's okay for us to talk about. It's okay because God is love. God is constantly putting our interest above his own interest. And the giving of his son is uh, the most evident way of God showing us love. Um, so learning how to love the people that God has placed um, in our path is something that's very important. And uh, there, there was a book written several years ago by Gary Chapman, The Five Love Languages. He mentions how people receive love. 
people give love and receive love. We usually try to give love the way that we receive love, but that's not how all people receive love. So he mentions them in this book, gifts, service, words, touch, quality time. And um, the art of loving people is trying to understand how people receive love. And if I'm a person that receives love through words, doesn't necessarily mean that the people that are that are in my camp all receive love through words. They might rather receive a gift or some sort of service or uh, waste a day with me and give me quality time. That's how I, or touch, um, a hug, holding hands, uh, a foot rub, whatever it is. But the idea here is um, one thing that we might want to do is just ask the people around us, how do you receive love? Here's what, here's what Paul is trying to teach us, though, is get out of yourself. Think of others. Um, not everybody is wired like uh, I'm wired. Not everybody's wired like you're wired. Put the interest of others above your own interest. Jesus Christ is the pattern here. But for Paul, he was also the prize. In chapter 3, verse 10, he says, I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection, and participation in his suffering, become like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I've already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which Christ or for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Many people look for happiness in religion. Um, religion says this: God is good, you are bad, try harder. That's religion. God is good, you are bad, try harder. And if there was ever a religious person, it was, it was the Apostle Paul. Paul was the, Paul, a Judaizer, and he was the best of the best. And when he reflected back on that life of dotting all the I's and crossing all the T's and doing everything perfectly, um, after having met Christ, he looked back at all that and he said, it's all garbage. He actually uses a stronger word that we can't even use on a Sunday morning but we'll just use the word garbage. And he came to this conclusion here, I have put my complete trust in Jesus for my righteousness. He could never get over the fact that Jesus should have punished him, but instead he pursued him. Jesus should have thrown him away, but instead he loved him. And so for Paul, Jesus was the prize. He's the one that he is pursuing I want to know Christ, he says, the power of his resurrection, participate in his suffering, and somehow attain to the resurrection from the dead. And so for Paul, Jesus Christ was everything. Do you know that as an American, you have the right to pursue happiness? Doesn't mean you'll find it, but you have that right as an American to pursue happiness. Paul would say to all of us, if you want to pursue happiness, Joy and happiness pursue Jesus Christ. He was Paul's prize. But the reason that we have this book is because, because Christ was his provision. The church heard that Paul was in trouble, so the church sent him money and resources, and he wrote back a thank you letter. Verse four, uh, Chapter 4, verse 10 says, I... Rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. That last verse there is a verse that we know very well. In fact, some of you may have a coffee mug with that uh, Philippians 4.13 on that. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Um, 
it's important to know what Paul means when he says that. Because a lot of, a lot of us will take a verse like that and we'll misuse it. Now, you know, I think we've all been guilty of that, certainly. But uh, I can be drinking coffee and look at I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me and, you know, be playing basketball with the guys a little bit later in the day and saying, hey, guys, clear the court because I'm about to dunk the basketball because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's not what Paul means here. What Paul means is everything that God wants you to be for him, he will provide for you. He's provided for Paul. Everything that God wanted Paul to be, he gave him and resourced him to be able to carry that out. I can do all, th I, I, listen, I can do life whether well-fed or hungry. I have learned the secret of being content. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So this week, instead of complaining about what you don't have, let's rejoice in what can't be lost. Life has a way of putting your joy behind bars, but faith has a way of giving us joy in the worst of circumstances. And this is where Paul finds himself. Paul, Paul finds himself in a jail. Um, this is kind of common for Paul. He goes to Philippi. In Acts chapter 16, there's a story. The story's kind of told there. And uh, he goes to jail. And before he's put into prison, he's beaten. Acts 16, verse 25, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. Hang on, what are they doing? They're in prison. What are they doing? They are praying and they're singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Wow. The very thing, very things you and I were, are doing this morning as we started this worship service. Praying, singing out to God. And what's happening here for, for Paul and Silas is that other people are listening in. The outsiders are listening in. What a great picture. Um, if we continue on like this, this might be something that uh, we might do in a way where our neighbors will understand what it is we do on the first day of the week. We pray, we sing hymns. And maybe we might open up a window and allow them to hear us singing these hymns. Paul and Silas are singing, praying and singing, and people are listening. Earthquake hits and freeze, freeze them from their shackles, opens the doors of the prison. The guard comes out who was in charge of them. He's about to end his own life for fear that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul says, stop, don't harm yourself. We're all here. And they have a conversation. And through that conversation, the jailer asks the question, what must I do to be saved? And so Acts chapter 16, 31, they reply, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and, all, and to all the others in the house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them, washed their wounds. Then immediately he and all of his household were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. Joy is our possession whenever Jesus Christ becomes our obsession, is the message of the book of Philippians. Join me in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for providing for us all that we need in Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, that he is someone that is to be loved and followed like Paul has taught us in this book. He is to be our obsession. And Father, whenever we embrace Jesus Christ like our brother Paul did, that we find ourselves in a place where we can discover, discover joy regardless of our circumstances. And so, Father, help us to, to reach, to reach for Jesus and to 
Find him while he can be found. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.